Welcome to the Free Dave Smart Clinic on Winning with Simplicity and Accountability presented by www.davesmartbasketball.com. Go to davesmartbasketball.com today to learn from one of the greatest minds in basketball as Dave Smart opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world with three all-access practices, videos, and one full defensive clinic. I cannot recommend these videos enough. Go to www.davesmartbasketball.com to get your access to one of the greatest collegiate coaches of all time. A coach that Villanova coach Jay Wright says is as bright as anyone I've ever met in our business. And UCLA coach Mick Cronin calls Dave one of the best basketball coaches in the world. Now let's get started. Please post any questions in the chat box at any time and I will do my best to get to as many questions as possible. Dave, welcome and thanks for sharing the game with us. Thanks for having me, Chris. Um, yeah, so I guess what we're going to talk mostly about today is just uh, some of the some our ideas at Carlton and my ideas in terms of gaining success and and sustainability. I mean, for me, for me, it's more about the sustainability of your success, and and I don't want to take away from people who have success in in the short term or or one time winning because it takes it takes a ton of good fortune a ton of hard work and a and a ton of intelligence to get that one win but for us it, it for me it's more about not necessarily ultimately winning but it's sustainability and the ability to be in a position to win every year you know to be in a position where you are one of three or four teams in our in our case of 50 teams are in the country to win every year for 15 to 20 years. And, you know, we, we, we've been fortunate that we've won 15 of our last 18, but I, I mean it, we've been fortunate um, in that we've been lucky some years, like some years we, we have been lucky and some years, you know, we, we have the three years we lost, I would say one year we weren't unlucky. I think uh, a better team beat us. But the other two years, I think we, we were a little unlucky. But we could have easily won eight. We could have easily won 10. But the fact is, in 18 years, or actually in 20 years, we were one of the four best teams in the country, which allows us to have a chance. In order to do that, to me, I think a lot of coaches complicated it. I mean – we don't run much. I mean, it's funny that now that I've taken over the position of, of overseeing both programs, so I meet with our coaches every day. I look at what we ran in the last weekend of the year, our national championship for 20 years, and what we ran offensively and what we did defensively. And what we did defensively, obviously we've changed it over the years in terms of little things and, and – details in it but we've run the same run and jump we picked up full we've only played man man to man we we've made adjustments in what we're doing and and the reads we make on all kinds of things like ball screens off ball screens flex screens everything but the base has always been the exact same and we've run the same stuff in week whatever 40 as we've run in preseason offensively it's always come down to us running I mean, Chris, Chris would, uh, would vouch for this because he played against us for years. When we got to nationals, we ran four things. And three of those things we ran 20 years ago, and we still run now. And then each year we'd, we'd run maybe one or two things that are different than we did the year before or five years earlier. But it, it basically those things were things we figured out that our personnel was best suited to better than the personnel five years earlier. But if you watched our teams 20 years from now or 20 years ago and 20 years later, we're running the same stuff. The difference is we've gotten better at the details. And we've gotten better at the details is because we learn every day as coaches what, what works, what doesn't work. We'll run a mid ball screen and we'll run a simple mid ball screen 70% of the time, just like most teams do at, at all levels. What we try to do is 
players understand what they're doing based on whether they're downing it, whether they're switching it, whether they're un going under it, whether they're, whether they're shocking it, whether they're trapping it or blitzing it, no matter what, we want our players to make the proper read and not just the people at the point of attack, but the three people off the ball. We want them to understand it and to ask questions off of it and to develop out of it. I mean, for us at our level, our goal is, is for sustainability, we need to develop our players. In order to have sustainability, our players who aren't playing in 2020 have, and are going to be playing a lot of minutes in 2021 have to be prepared. I mean, how many years I think we've lost three all Canadians or two all Canadians and a first team all-star and everybody's thought that we were going to be weak the next year, except the people in our room, because we knew the players in our room who weren't playing a lot were almost as good as the guys who were all Canadians because they were playing against them every day in practice and they were competing against them and they were getting better, but they were getting better because they were learning how to read every situation. So we, we don't necessarily change game to game as much as we give our guys an understanding of what a coach may do to us based on what they do game to game through film. Again, it's not as simple as that because the good coaches change things up defensively game to game, how they cover ball screens, how they cover off ball screens, what they're doing matchup wise. The bad coaches, it's a little easier and you can basically prep your team and have them ready for the game. The good coaches, the players have to be ready for whatever they're going to face. And because of that, our practices, and you can see it, and Chris will be happy because I'm boosting the, the practice videos, but you can see it in our practices. We expect defensively when we're working on offense for the five guys on the defensive team, which isn't our focus as coaches, to do what they want on ball screens. So they can, they can down a ball screen against a certain guy. They can go under a ball screen. They can blitz a ball screen. They can do whatever they want. There's just got to be a logical reason to get that player on the other team to be trying to play against playing in their weakness. So we want our guys when they're not on the offensive end, which is what we're focusing on to be thinking on the defensive end and to be attacking their teammates every single day on the defensive end and vice versa. When we're working on offense or working on defense, we're expecting the offensive team to attack the defense based on what we're working on. And they've got a head start because they know in the practice plan, what we're working on, whether it's blitzing a ball screen, whether it's downing the ball screen or whether it's shocking a ball screen, they all know that defensively that's what we're working on that day. So they can come into practice as a group, and have a plan on offense that's been thought out and understood, and they can learn from the reads that they got to make off that stuff. So it's an everyday development thing. And what it leads to is the players who aren't playing a lot are getting better every day, partly by thinking, partly by playing against better players. So that when they're ready and they're in a position to play in games, it's, it's really just a case of getting used to the noise. Nothing else is new to them. The only thing that's new to them is the noise of the crowd and the hype that comes behind it. But, you know, a lot of those kids dealt with that in high school, and now they're, it's just getting re, refocused on it. The other part of it is, in terms of sustainability, is it develops guys to be able to play anywhere. So when our guys go to national team tryouts, they have seen it all. They have seen – every way you can play a ball screen because we defend everything's based on forcing people to their weakness. They have played, they have defended guys differently every single possession in a practice. Cause if he's a lefty, we cut, we, we force them one way. If he's a righty, we force them a different way. If he's a shooter, non-shooter post player, non post player, good passer, bad passer. So every day they're thinking about that and they're, matched up in different ways. So if they go to a national team tryout or go to Europe at a, to play on a, a, on a European pro team, if that team forces baseline, it, they've done it. They force baseline. If that for, team funnels middle, they've done it. If that team is a, 
is a down team, they've done it. If it's a, if it's a blitz team, they've done it. They may not have done it every single time, but they've seen it and they've done it. And from a spacing standpoint, we, we, pretty, we pr make it pretty consistent. Obviously, spacing is a coaching philosophy. Some people will space with four perimeter. Some, some want to dive two. We're a two dive because it opens up more opportunities to shoot threes. But basically what happens is by every day being a player development day, as opposed to being a team development day, and every day being a detail day on simple, simple things, the players get better. When the players get better, they're more prepared to play when it's their turn to play. When the players get better, when they go play in summer programs or on pro teams, they're prepared to play and they move up the ranks quick. And they have, they have way more success than guys who come out of systems. And everybody says, well, Carlton runs a system. It's really not. We play man-to-man -man defense. We run and jump. We set a ton of mid-ball screens. And we, we run some one, one sort of continuation motion, motion movement. And, and that's it. And then we talk about reading what the defense does to play off those things. So when our guys get to Europe, they always overachieve based on what people expect coming from a youth sport team and coming from our level. But it's because nothing is new to them. They're not learning anything new. And I mean, I talk to all our pros about what their experience is in, in Europe at, with these pro teams. And I, and I, I mean, generally it's a pretty positive experience for our guys and they generally get some really good coaching, but I ask them very specifically, is there anything that you went through in practices or games that you didn't go through with us, you know, or that they're focusing more on there than we ever focused on so that what happens is when an Aaron Dornicamp plays 11 years and plays in EuroLeague and plays in youth sport, when we're recruiting a kid out of high school, we're recruiting a kid who's similar to the level that Aaron was at coming out of high school. And they know, these kids know where they stand coming out of high school. And if they see that this guy went to our school and played 11 years making a ridiculous amount of money playing in EuroLeague after five years with us, that translates to them so it makes recruiting easier because they see that their development as a player is all that matters. When they see that our guys are the guys who are making the national team other than power five level guys, they see that it's, it's, they're learning every single day and they're more prepared for their next level. So a lot of the guys who we recruit, they're not coming to our school because they want to win national championships. They're coming to our school because they want to play on the national team and they want to play European basketball, pro basketball, and make a living doing it. And because of that, we get them and they are trying to develop every day. And because they get to that level, we win national championships. But the national championships is never something we talk about. We never talk. We very seldom talk about our team goals we, we we talk about our individual development goals and guys staying consistent what they in what they say they want to do and i think if you want sustainability in terms of recruiting in terms of of next man up it, it's the only way to do it if, if you're going to try to do things that are going to win you in the short term it's going to help in the short term, but it's going to kill you in the long term. And again, every year I sit there and go, is this the best stuff defensively and offensively for this group? And every year we talk about it as coaches and every year we say, you know what, we could do some things a little different that fits this dynamic a little better, but it's going to kill our sustainability. It's going to kill us moving forward because it's going to kill our development because we're going to do system type stuff and we're going to get good at that, but we're not going to be good at reads. And next year, the next man up isn't going to be ready to play at the level we need them to play at. So to me, the whole point of 
keeping it simple, but being incredible with your details leads to development. And again, the accountability facet. I just don't think anybody, anybody uh, cares to focus on the accountability at the level that they need to care about. I mean, I was lucky in, in my time. When I first started out, before we were deep, yelling and screaming was allowed. In 1998, 99, you could get a ye away with yelling and screaming. So I only had seven or eight, maybe eight and a half guys who could play at a national championship level. But we just, if, if they didn't listen, we just ran like crazy and I just yelled like crazy and I just scared them into doing stuff. Now you can't do that. In my last 10 years coaching, you couldn't do that. Chris coached with me 20 years ago and the way I was 20 years ago compared to the way I am now is totally different. Just, you got you to gotta move with the times. But in order to do that, in order to hold people accountable, you need to be willing to sit people or take away what they want, which in most cases is minutes, or in some cases it's roles. And you need enough depth in order to do that on a consistent basis. If you don't have enough depth when you bench your best player because they're not doing the things and you're trying to hold them accountable, you're cutting your, your own hand off. If, if you don't do the things in terms of development and having a next man up situation where you have 10 or 11 players who maybe aren't interchangeable, but certainly allow you to take away minutes or take away roles from people who aren't buying in, if, if you can't do that, it's hard to keep people accountable in 2020. I'm fully aware of that. You're not, you're not going to be able to do the things that people did 20, 25 years ago. So you need, you need to find a way to do it in other ways. And, and you need, but if you don't hold people accountable, anybody who allows people to do certain things the way they want to do it, it's only, it's only going to be a short, short term short-term cure you're going to lose anyway i mean it, it and and if you're not if your job's not based on wins and losses so if you're a high school coach you're better off paying the price in the short term to gain in the long term because you're going you're not ultimately going to win if your team isn't based on accountability how you do that again like i said if you're not deep it gets hard in 2020 but if you're deep it's easy i mean we at carlton we have an advantage because I feel like we have 11, 11 guys and even on the women's team coming up 10 or 11 kids who aren't interchangeable, but are close enough. And if we benched our best player, if the next four best players raise their game 2% and we replace that best player with the next man, next player up, we, we'd be more successful than our best player not buying it. But you need to have that you, at the university level where your job depends on winning. You, you need to have that depth. Your depth is absolutely key for so many reasons. Forget injuries, just for accountability. And the other part is you need everything to be competitive. competitive. If, if they're not earning their, their roles, and we set roles, and they're very clearly, clearly defined. There is no democracy with our stuff. We have matchup spots. We have non-matchup spots. And if people want to play out of the non-matchup spots, they, they need to earn their, their, their spot in the matchup spot. They, they get to train as much or more than we put out there for them. They, they have to earn it. They're, no one, no one gets to do it, gets to play the position they want to play unless, unless they earn it. And I believe that at every level. My, my little guys are, are 10 and seven and I coach my 10 year old in triple A hockey. And he came to me, he played right wing and he said, I want to play center. And I go, well, that's awesome. But you're playing right wing. And he said, well, why don't I get to play center? And I go, cause you haven't earned it. You're not good enough. Well, how do I earn it? Well, he, I'll talk to the other coaches. We'll put something together. If you do that and are successful in that, and they feel that you're good enough to change, change from right wing to center, we'll put you there. But until you earn it, you're not playing that position. 
And the first time he went out on the ice in practice, he played right wing and pouted. And I threw him, I, uh, it's a little different because it's my kid, but I threw him off the ice and I went in and talked to him. I said, so you think that the best way to play the position you want to play is to pout because you're not there yet. It, it just doesn't work. They need to earn their opportunity. And he's, he was nine years old at the time. It took three minutes of talking to him to get him out on the ice playing harder than he's ever played at right wing. And a month later, he's playing center, pushed by the other coaches, not by, by me, because he knew what he had to do to earn it, and he earned it. And the person who got knocked out of center, again, they pouted for a day until we talked to them and said, if you keep pouting, you're more likely to play, be playing goalie in a month than you are to be back playing center. So your best bet is to do what so-and-so did, which is work as hard as you can in your role. And you all hear this. The problem is no one does this crap. Like everybody talks it. Everybody reads the books. Everybody, everybody says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're brilliant, Dave. Way to throw it out there. Yeah, no, I'm not brilliant. I've, I've read a million leadership books. I've, I've, re- I've, I've heard these speeches from, but no one does it. No one stands up to it because it's a pain in the ass. It's a lot of confrontation. It's a lot of com- communication. It's a lot of dealing with individuals and a lot of just being flat, flat out honest with people. If you're going to pout. I'm going to make things worse on you. So you can pout all you want, but things are going to get worse. And if you want to quit, you know what, you're pouting anyway. So you in a pout mode or you quitting, it's all the same. It doesn't, it doesn't help our team either way. You, you need to deal with these conversations and you need to, to confront them. And if you don't, you're ultimately going to lose. And, and you can do the, the nice guy or the nice person thing in the short term, but you're still ultimately going to lose. And again, one of the simple things that we'll, we're, I'm going to talk about here is just us offensively with a mid ball screen. And again, I just finished three and a half hours of film with, with our two, with groups from our two teams doing zoom. And even though I'm dumb as shit, I'm actually really good at the sharing of, uh, of video because I do this for two hours, three hours a day. But I think it's in a lot of cases, a waste of time. Most of the coaches on this call probably want me to put film on the the screen so they can see it to me it's a waste of time i don't we we show film with our team but a lot of time i just do it this way i tell my players get a piece of paper out figure out what i'm talking about write it down if you get confused ask questions and if you stop listening or you stop writing stuff down you're gonna get lost so you might as well just in this case get off the call in our case just go to sleep or walk out of the team meeting because you're not you're you're going to be lost you're never going to catch up So I'm not going to put it on video because it's too easy to get the general sense of it without getting the details. So for, for example sake, I'm going to talk about mid ball screens on the mid ball screen. What I'm talking about is setting the ball screen. What we will do is their weakest ball screen defender. Usually, we'll say, to keep it simple, they're five men. It could be their four. It could be their three. But the, the guy that they're going to get in the most trouble with if they switch. So we want to put them in situations where it's not a comfortable switch. So we're going to ball screen with their weakest. We're going to put, obviously, our best shooters in one slot or whatever you want to call it, 60 slot sort of 60 degrees off the, off the elbow, a player in, the, in, in each corner and reading off that ball screen. Now, when we set the ball screen, if we are setting the ball screen with a non-shooter, so is covering our non-shooter, then what's going to happen in that case is we are going to roll, and excuse me, I just got to move spots because my son's doing a school thing, but we're going to set our screen. Our base spot for our screen is going to be 
the elbow extended. So if we're setting the ball screen with a non-shooter, we're going to set it as the base at the elbow extended. Everybody got that written down? Now, that is our base spot. If we know that they're going to either show hard on it or more likely wait, but weak it and push it into the middle of the floor, but, but weak it, we're going to set that screen away from our base spot and set it three feet outside. Dave, can you just pull the blind behind you? Yeah, I'll move. Yeah. So you're going to set it three feet outside that elbow. If, they're, if we know that they're going to wait but push the ball into the middle. If we know they're going to shock it, we're going to set it on the elbow, extend it. If we know they're going to down it, based on scouting and based on consistency with what they do, we're going to set it three feet inside that elbow. Basically creating space depending on how that team's going to set the ball screen. If, if we've scouted them and 95% of the time they're going to down it, then we're going to start the game setting it three feet inside because we know that if they're going to do something different, they're not going to be good at it. So we can get away with a possession or two of setting it in the wrong spot, knowing that they're not comfortable either because they've never done it before. And we tell our guys that. This is what they do 95% of the time. If they do something different, what it should lead for you is confidence because they are not comfortable with this. If they push it in and wait, then we're going to set it three feet outside. If they shock it, we're going to set it right on that elbow. And this is what, or, they sw or they're going to switch it, we set it right on that elbow. So this is with uh, non-shooting. They down it. If they wait on it, we the the screener is going to round his cut. So he's going to go opposite the ball handler, and he's going to round his cut. Make it, get as much separation from the weight person or the or the down person as possible, and ideally make that offside guard full-on commitment to them. If they shock it or they switch it, it's a hard roll to the front of the rim. So this is the non-shooting post. They make that read on every screen. They've got to round it, and they'll round it as far as they have to. They may round it all the way, and, and if – if we're slow on our attack and we're patient on our attack, they may round all the way under to uh, underneath the rim to make that offside guard commit as, as deep as possible. Now, again, let's say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they do on the screen. Our guys have to read the, the people at the point of attack, make that read the, the, the point guard, or the person coming off that screen, if it's a shock, they, they're playing off that person's top foot. And they're always playing off that top person's top foot. We don't talk about a hesitation dribble. We talk about attacking that top foot, foot. So if they shock it or blitz it, they stay on that top foot and drag them as far as they can. And, and, and as soon as that, that post makes a commitment, the ball's got to be gone, either on a penetration themselves or off the pass. If they're being downed or weighted, they attack that top foot all the time. The only time they're not going to attack that top foot is if they feel comfortably, comfortable to snake it. But the snake has to be an unselfish snake. And what I mean by that, they got to make it easy on the post screener to read what they're doing. A lot of guards make it a selfish snake. So they kind of take on the post and go two, three feet by the screen. 
their post is already committed to the round going one direction. Then all of a sudden the guard snakes it and runs right into their post. And now the post is done. The post is out of the play. And if the team you're playing is good, the guard is out of the play because he's got two covering him and he's got no chance. And then he's going to scream at his post for not spacing properly, but he killed his post by snaking too late. So if he's going to snake, he's got to snake early so the post goes opposite. And the post can make an easy read. Because as the post turns to round it, he sees that there's nowhere to go because the guard's already snaked him and he rounds it the other way. So these are the details we're talking about if we're setting a screen and that's just on the point of attack. The other three players are making the same read. The person who is on that top slot, if it is a shock, a blitz, or a switch, all right? They are, but especially a, blo a, a shock or a, or a blitz, they are stepping to the ball and stepping hard to the ball so that they catch the ball as opposed to on the deep 60, more in the middle of the floor, so they, uh, they have no situation that a defensive player is two passes away. When they catch it, the defense is screwed because they're all one pass away. Whereas if they stay put, they're screwed. Because now, or they step high, they're screwed because now the defense can protect the basket, protect the roller by and playing the nail or the elbow. But if they step two and they get the ball, everybody's one pass away and the next pass is per easy. Now everybody says, well, they're not going to be open. Well, if they're not open, it's because their check denies them. If their check denies them, then the ball side corner has lifted as well. If their check denies them, they'll push back to the ball side corner. And if he's wide open because his check is tagged, then he's got a wide open three, a long closeout, or if it's a panic closeout, he's got a, layup, a pass for a layup or a, a, a skip, an easy skip. The other person on the offside, if they tag with the two side, which is what we generally do, if we deny, if they deny that push to the middle, then all of a sudden that offside corner, there's no one within 30 feet of them if the roller is covered. And if there is someone within 30 feet of them, that means the roller is wide open at the, at the tee. Everybody has to make the exact same read at the exact same time. So for me, I don't even watch in practice the point of attack. I only watch the three off the ball in that case. And if we're not setting a screen, I only watch the four off the ball. I have one of my, my assistants watch the point of attack because everybody wants to watch the point of attack anyway. So I just let them, if I don't have them watching the point of attack, a lot of the time, younger coaches always say they're watching off the ball, but they get drawn to the ball. So I'll let an assistant watch the ball and if something weird happens and I don't see it I just ask them what the hell happened there usually you can figure out what happened but sometimes I don't, they kick it off their foot they throw it off someone's face you don't expect that to happen and that's what happened you know sometimes it's just a physical mistake now in the same sense if you're setting it with a roller and they're downing it or they're waiting on it it's this, they have to make the same reads. So now they're downing it. If they're downing it, the slot person has to curl behind early, almost follow that guard down the lane and curl behind and force their check to commit to them. Because if they don't commit to them, it's going to be a wide open three most of the time. At worst, it's going to be a long closeout if that person curls right behind the penetration. So the lift becomes a really high lift. At the same time, the post is rounding their cut, going to the offside block and almost under the basket. And the person who is on the same side as the person who's curling behind, 
now can lift extremely high. And we want our penetrator to basically look for themselves for as long as possible. When they can't find something for themselves, then they're looking for that rolling post for as long as possible. Because we trust that the other two have lifted high enough that if they end up having to jump stop, and a lot of this, a lot of the jump stop, stop stuff we have, we've gotten through, like Jay, Jay Wright and I, if you notice Villanova, do a ton of jump stop stuff and are late with that pass out. Like I, I really think it's important that you do that because you've got the best opportunity to get yourself a layup, to get your post a late dump off when the offside guards have tagged, but then they've recovered before their post has been able to recover. You get a ton of layups off that. And if the guard, offside guard commits to the tag longer, it's easy on the jump stop to find either one of those lift guards wide open. The same holds for if they weight it as opposed to lock it. So now the guard is going into the middle of the floor, but they're weighting it. A lot of the times when teams are weighting it, they try to cover the nail and cover the penetration with that slot guy. So now that slot guy is spacing away from the penetration. So getting deeper on that 45 almost to the, or on that 60 almost to the 45. Now the deep guy who's in the corner, he has the option, depending on what the defense does. When, when he gets, when the slot guy goes to the 45, the deep guy, a lot of the time, his man will step up to help on that slot guy. A lot of the time, he'll be wide open in the corner, but even better, he can, he can dive back door because the post is rounding the other way. And now the ball side, side guard who's on, his, on the side on his own is lifting as high as he can. Again, expect not expecting the pass early. Sometimes he does get it early if they make a mistake. But a lot of the time he's expecting it off the jump stop. So the guard goes deep. They tag with the one side. He looks for himself. He looks for the post late. The, he's not there late because the tag stays a long time, but now the tag realizes that, oh shit, my guy has now lifted almost to the, almost to the top and I have no chance to get back. A lot of the time they're going to tag with the two side. If they tag with the two side, he has, he's coming so far to get to that, to that round that the deep corner is wide open whether he stays in the corner or he backdoors for a lap. So again, this is just with a rolling post. If the person setting the screen is a shooting post, then it's a whole new set of rules. Now, I'll give you the initial setup before we get to questions, because I feel like I'm just going to go on forever. But if, if the guy who, cut, who switches the worst on the other team is covering one of our one of our shooters. Now we're going to set the screen in the middle of the floor. Because that person's going to pick and pop. So if they set the screen in the slot, they're not going to have enough room to, to pop because he's going to run into that corner guy. So we set it in the middle of the floor. The, we've got now two guards in the corner and we've got the non shooting the worst shooter, usually our five, but our worst shooter standing at the tee. He can start offside the guard. So if the guard rejects, he's already on the offside block. But as the guard gets to the screen, he's got to get the, to, to the middle. Because the guard may use the screen, and then the low guy goes offside, or he may reject the screen, and then he stays stays opposite that guard. Again, it's hard if you're not writing it down unless you spend 16 hours a day doing basketball like Chris Oliver does and he understands what, I, what I'm saying because he sees it. But 
If you don't write it down, it's very difficult to see this. The last thing I'm going to say is we're using the ball screen. We make it, we are all over our guards to set up the ball screen, but not the way most people set up a ball screen. So in other words, we want our guard to get opposite where the post covering the screen is. So if he's up on the screen, whether he's ready to switch, whether he's ready to blitz, whether he's ready to shock, our guard will make it look like he's going to use the screen. As soon as he makes him look like he's going to use the screen, he is going to try hard to reject and go opposite that post. Against good teams, it never happens because they, they, they're, they're determined to make you use that screen. But what happens is if you sell like you're going to use it, every once in a while they move a little bit more than they should, and then now when you cut back to reject, they have to drop deeper to cut off your rejection, which means the screen can be set lower. Not to mention that the post has to trust his guard that he's going to cut it off. Otherwise, he's going to move more to get to the help. And now you're, he's going to be less ready to cover the shock or the blitz the way he wants to. Not to mention that the screen's set lower, so you've got more room to maneuver if they are going to shock or switch. Same thing goes if, if they're downing it. We make it look like we're going to go to the down, that we're going to just go where you're asking us to go, we're going to take two steps that way, and then we're going to try as hard as we can to get to the naked ball screen. The good teams, they don't let you get there. But in order to stop you from getting there, because they've also been told when they're downing, as soon as you make a hard move to try to cut it off, like hover your, their post, slow you down, and then you cut it off as early as you can to not have your post occupied as long. So they're going to they're gonna move pretty hard in order to help their pull step, which allows you to have a better chance to get to that naked ball screen. They're going to have to work hard to really jam you up and deny access. At the same time, the post, their post may feel like the guard's going to get hit by that screen and starts moving away from his lock position. And if they don't work in unison perfectly, but the guard cuts them off, now our guard now does attack the weight or the lock down whatever you want to call it but their post has moved and their post is now recovering on the move as opposed to standing and being in an athletic stance and being comfortable all these things are extremely important to gaining that half step edge and to me the half step edge is key to winning championships you know when it, it may not matter at all to the teams we're beating by 30 or 40 points. And our, our guards may get sloppy saying this doesn't matter. But when we get to nationals and have to play three games in three days against the seven best teams in the country, that half second makes a huge difference. And to me, you know, like I really believe that keen on that half second is why we've gone 48 and three over 18 years against the seven best teams every year at the end of the year. I mean, to, to me, I look at the teams we played in those 18 years, and there were a hell of a, lot, hell of a lot of really, really, really good basketball teams and incredibly coached teams. And I think out of 54 games, we've lost three. So – to, to me, that's because of the details. Because if you're sloppy against really well-coached, good teams, you're not, you're not scoring. You're not, you're not being successful. And we do that within everything we do. I just talked to our new women's coach, and I said, look, we just got to focus on the details. Transition D, ball screen D, our quarter court must-dos, and our transition must-dos, and using our ball screen must-dos basically five things that we must do them perfectly and it, everything else yes there's little things we can do to put us over the top against against certain teams but we're not we're not in that position if we don't take care of the must-dos 
and make it competitive, make them accountable, and make them understand the details and make sure they're getting better every single day development-wise, mentally and physically. Chris, do you want me to go on on something else, or are we gone too well, let's long? Take a, let's take a few questions. Um, coaches, as, as you probably knew coming into this, you'll need to watch it again. We'll post a replay. And uh, the other thing is, again, like if you have not got those all-access all practice videos and his defensive clinic, you're just missing out. Because, again, you get to see it raw and real, what Dave's talking about. And, again, the visuals that go with what he's saying – it will just impact you so much as a coach. And I know it impacted me, especially as a young coach. One of my first kind of experiences with Dave shaped me for the rest of my career. So grateful for that. Dave, maybe you can talk about what are those individual development goal talks like? Well, I mean, again, what we talk about, I, I, I don't think it's anything different than what most people talk about. We, we talk, of, we talk about what they want for me. For me, it's all about redefining fun, you know, like, and, and that's with seven and 10 year olds too. Like we talk about with our competitive kids at seven and 10 years old, like they're fun. Like my kids right now are out in the pool. That's their fun. They're goofing around. They're on, like, that's their fun. But when, when they're in their practice, if they want to play competitively as opposed to house league, they need to understand their fun has to be hard work. So we talk about, what they the players need to do in terms of redefining their fun they need to decide what their fun is going to be and how hard work into their fun you know how watching film becomes fun for them what they want to do so where they see themselves as a player and what what they want to become as a player because if if you're in the gym teaching them stuff that you want them to learn but they don't want to learn it's useless. You know, on the other hand, if they want to learn things that are useless to them, like if my, if my 6'8", 230 pound five man wants to play point guard and he's just never going to have good enough hands or quick enough feet to do it. And I go, okay, so what, where do you want to play? I want to be the point guard. Well, all right. I've got a list of house leagues where they're gonna, you're good enough, you'll be able to play home, play point guard. And if you want to come to our camps, you can come to our camps, but you ain't playing competitive basketball at that position, you know, or vice versa, the five nine kid who wants to be the five man, you know, like it, you're you're just not built for that. Now, obviously, you say you could be built for something close to that, but you're not built for that. So we're in a bit of a dilemma right from the start. Because your fun is playing point guard, but my ability to make you the best player possible is not in that position, not doing those things. So most of the time, what they want to do and what they want to be good at is consistent with what their body type and their physical attributes allow, you know, and their mental attributes allow. So a lot of the times it's pretty easy, but you got to be honest. We're just very honest. Yeah. You're not good enough to do this. So here's what you need to do. Here are the base things you need to do. I will get in the gym with you or assistants will get in the gym with you and teach you these base things. You know what? Then we're not going to be in the gym with you for four or five days. And we're going to come back four or five days later and get back in the gym and see where you're at. If you're nowhere, then you really don't want to do that. So Let's establish your role based on your work ethic. We're going to give you what you need to do. We're going to give you five, six days to master it to the level that you can master it. Obviously, they're going to have holes in it because they're not going to have coaches. But you can tell whether they spent the time and whether it means something to you. So our individual meetings, like they're, they're not – I do individuals with our guys even now once a week. I don't do them – five times a week. I don't see why I would do them five times a week. I do them once a week and they have access to the gym. And, and I tell our assistants, listen, if they ask you to get in the gym with them, I'm good with that. But if they're no more than twice a week, the other two or three times they are doing it with their teammates or alone. Cause I want to see that they're doing it and they're, they're driving themselves and they're, they're getting better on their own. And if we come back a week later and I've shown them something, 
and they're not any better at it, I just say to them, like, this is a waste of time. Like, either you are too afraid to tell me that you think my stuff that I'm teaching you sucks, which means you're never going to be any good anyway. Because if you're not strong enough to tell me in an individual that you think my stuff sucks and are willing to argue with me about why what you want to do is better, or you're just too lazy and you're just trying to basically kiss my butt and make me think you care when you don't care and you're calling me stupid by thinking that I'll buy into you working at it. It's one or the other. Either way, this is a waste of time. So why are you here? Why am I here? Are we actually trying to get better? And we just call them out on it. Now, I'm not the head coach anymore. I'm just doing a ton of film and individual work with them. And I talk with the head coaches every day. But with them, I see them two, three times a week. But I just say, don't show up. I don't want you here. Like, show up when you want to show up. And then they show up, you know. But then they also call me out on stuff. Like, they're not, they're not afraid to say, I don't like this. I don't understand why I'm doing this. You know, and, and how you talk to them when they call you out is very important. You know, when, when, when it's the, I don't understand, I think I should do it this way, then there's no, no reason to get upset at them. Now, if they're throwing their teammate under the bus to, to save themselves, then that's fully different. But in terms of how we talk to them, we ask them what they want. We ask them what they want their role to be. We tell them what they need to do to get to that role. You know, I've had guys come in and say, this guy gets to do this. I don't get to do that. I said, you're not good. Enough. Well, what do you mean? I'm not good enough. You're not good enough to do it. Let's earn it. So if you want to get up at five 30 in the morning every day, I'll pull Chris Oliver. I'll start getting up at five 30 every morning. I won't like it, but I'll get up at five 30. If you, if you're calling me at five 30, I'll be there. Just understand if we're not spending three hours a day for the next three months, you're not ever going to pass that guy because he's better than you. So I will help you pass him, but please don't get mad if all of a sudden you pass him and he starts showing up with me at 5.30 in the morning because if he wants my help, I'm going to help him too. But this is what you're going to have to do to get better. And this is what you're going to have to do to change your role. I am not going to play favorites in terms of role. Whoever I think is better is going to play the role, that role. And if you guys fight tooth and nail to take that role, that is awesome for us because we just get better as a team and whoever we put in that role is going to be that much better. If you don't challenge him, he's going to, he's going to have slippage. If you challenge him, even if he stays ahead of you, it's good for me because he won't have slippage. And if you pass him, it's good for me too. Everything in terms of competition is good for me and I will help you any way I can. And if I don't feel like waking up at 5.30, I'll get Jamie to wake up at 5.30. So. Coaches, that's the magic right there. That's the magic. Dave, we got about five minutes. You okay with one more question? Yeah, I, I mean, if you want to go a little longer, I'm good. Okay. Uh, so can you, you talked about uh, point of attack and assistant coaches. Can you talk a little bit more about how you help and define roles for assistant coaches within practice? So what we try to do is, we, I mean, we tr again, it, it goes along the whole premise that, that you're – you're only going to get better and you're only going to work hard if you're having fun doing it. So basically our setup is if, if we're working on offense, so, you know, I mean, whatever percentage we're working on offense, whatever percentage we're working on defense, I, if I'm the head coach, I'm focused on off the ball, what, whatever we're working on. So if we're working on defense, I'm focused on off the ball defense. If we're working on offense, I'm working on off the ball offense, spacing, uh, matchups, all that stuff. The other coaches, depending how many we have, if we have, if we have two there, then one of them, and they decide between each other who gets to get off the ball opposite me. And then the other one, if there's only two, gets to choose between on the ball defense on the ball offense or rebounding. 
and they get to choose and they focus on that. If we have four or five or four, four assistant coaches there, as opposed to two, then before practice, they sit down and they decide what they're, they're most want to do that day. And they, fo they focus on that. So off the ball, opposite me, on the ball, same as me, on the ball, opposite me, and rebounding. And they, and, and they focus on those things for the entire practice. Great stuff. And the difference is I'm the only one who can stop practice, but they can sub anyone off anytime. So if someone makes a mistake, they can sub them off, put the, someone else on, and talk to that player about what they did wrong. Now, if we're in a situation where we only have 10 and we're going five on five, I will allow the person who's opposite me uh, off the ball. They'll, they're allowed to like put their hand up to get my attention and, so, and I'll let them stop it once in a while. I don't want them stopping it whenever they feel like it because I've got I've to make sure the flow stays the same. But Chris, if you were opposite me and you – and you know you can't sub the person off, but you know you need to – like, I, you're my assistant. I trust that you know when you can wait till, the, till I'm talking to get your words in or whether you need to do it now. Like, you know the player well enough to know that you got to tell them right now. So you put your hand up, and I know that what you're going to say, I'm going to go, oh, shit, yeah, he had to say it then because so-and-so, if, if we went three more possessions, he ain't going to remember what Chris is talking about. So – I'm going to trust you to stop it only when you need to stop it so that we keep the flow of practice. Good. Why ball screens over dribble handoffs is more of a technical question. We do it all. That's what I said. I mean, we, we do a million dribble handoffs. I just pick ball screens. And we didn't even get into a lot of detail with the screener being a pop guy like all the spacing on it. I just picked, so mid ball screens, handoffs, flares, flare action or, or, or pin down action, you know, all that stuff, those are the details that we talk about. And defensively, it's the same thing. We talk about covering actions way more than we talk about the, what teams are running. I mean, we, we will go through in film what other teams are running but we, it's really not a focus. We focus on covering the actions that they're really good at. The only reason we show the sets that they run is because if you don't show your players the sets that they run, they've been in so many places where that's been a focus, they'll start thinking, well, you don't know what you're doing. You're not showing the other team's sets. But really, you don't need to show the other team's sets. You show the other team's sets to show the action they're good at. Because honestly, I've been doing this like at the university level and we've been pretty good for 22 years. And I can name you three players who I trust that if I show them the set, that if I let them cheat the sets, that they will make the right play most of the time. I mean, Chris, you've done this a long time. How many guys, like one or two in your 15 years, like at U Sport where you go, you know what, I'll show them the set and I'll, like, I know you're a little nicer than I am, so you give them more reign to do it, but I, but I would, and I was too, early on. But every time it's like, I let that guy make the read he wanted, and he just cost us a wide open three. He just cost us a layup. So let's just teach them, like, like if I show them too much the other team, then too many guys think they're smarter than the other team. And when they have good coaches, the coach has set, just set my players up. You know, and I think my players are pretty smart. And I think my players work really hard at understanding the thing. But these, the coaches are doing it 16 hours a day, and they're 40 to 60 years old. They're going to set those guys up most of the time. Absolutely. Good point. Uh, what drills, and not necessarily drills, but maybe the, what you teach or the drills or how you do it, but to get your guys to read closeouts to attack them? What are some things that you do to help your guys understand how to attack closeouts? Well, we, we try to combine 
a, a lot of our offensive and defensive stuff together. Um, in that we'll we'll call we'll we'll work on our rotations, which which causes a lot of uh, like in a three on three set or a two on two set, um, where or or a four on four set, five on five, where we allow the initial penetration, and then then cause the closeout on the on the next pass. When we're working on it offensively, a lot of the time we're doing it out of two on two, three on three, so that we get the read whether it whether it's an up fake, whether it's a rip and go, whether it's a whether it's a shot, you know, reading whether it's a long closeout or a short closeout, and what we need to do on the catch, whether it's almost a running catch, whether it's an up fake, whether we're catching it square to the passer or square to the basket, depending whether we're one or two passes away. But we do a lot of that stuff off either just a one pass and go with no penetration or a penetration and a help and causing closeouts and rotations so they're dealing with long closeouts. But we do, we break that down. Chris, you know that. You, you make fun of the three-on-three -three stuff. Like, like, again, I'm with you on a lot of five-on-five -five stuff in terms of teaching people how to play, and we do a ton of five-on-five, -five and you can see that in our practices. But when we do our actual development individual work where we can get four six people in a gym that's when we do a lot of our reads and stuff where where they're they're reading off a short closeout reading off a long closeout reading we're reading whether they're respected as a shooter or not but i agree i mean i assume a lot of the people on this call do a lot of your basketball immersion stuff so i do like you'll see in our practices when we're when we've got 10 or more people we teach mostly, like not most, well, I would say 75% or even a little more in a five on five set. But then when we do our breakdown stuff and we only have four to six people in a group, then we do, that's when we do our breakdown stuff. I find a lot of people break down their, their practices where they have 10 or more people too much in, into, into small games when they don't get that opportunity to learn the game in, in, a, in the real setting. You've got a ton of chances to get four people in a gym together. Don't be lazy. Get them in a gym together. So just for coaches, and I agree, Dave, with what you're saying, the player development and reads and decisions and all that are done within smaller breakdowns. So instead of doing one-on-one -on -one workouts with players, you would more value having them in some type of – competitive play to develop skills so you do the one on oh yeah. and then you move it to the one on one then you move it to the two on two on two and the three on three but you, if you just do it one on one it's just not real you know like you, you can't you can't simulate you know like i, I mean it, it, and yeah you just can't simulate the way you need to simulate especially for for non-pros i mean pros a lot of the time they've had enough repetitions that they they they've done it enough that they just want some basic stuff and they they have an assistant coach doing it and that's enough for them because they've had had, a, had their 10,000 reps or whatever you want to call it already but for kid players 20 and under they they need to play at a game speed a lot and in a comp, competitive setting because it's not a rep it's not one of your 10,000 if it's not real like if it's not full speed couldn't agree more. And for coaches that have seen the video of Ball Access Praxis, you will know what I'm talking about and you'll know what Dave's talking about, especially when you get a chance to watch him coach one-on-one. -on -one. And it's never, well, it's almost never about tactical, tactical. Most of your one-on-one -on -one is about getting them to compete and understand how to compete, right? Yeah, I mean, at, at our level, at the university level, a lot of them, are, are, are I mean they're in university they're they're playing elite basketball they're smart kids they they it's it's really about finding finding their drive you know sometimes it's about positive reinforcement a lot of the time with me because of the relationships I build and the personality I am it's about poking the bear you know like they they do it with me I do it with them it's it's all based on personality you know what your relationship is with the kid and what your personality is, what their personality is. Tremendous. Tremendous. You got time for another? Sure. Uh, the 
uh, terminology of read the feet. Somebody has heard you use that or one of your assistants use that in terms of instructing the mid ball screen. Uh, kept saying, read the feet, read the feet. Is that something? Yeah, so, so a lot of it, I mean, it's all communication. And I think we, we all try to communicate a lot with our, with our voice. But to, to us, there's a lot of communication that goes on with, with their feet and their body movement. And, and where they are. So like with our, with our post D, for example, our, our posts are, are instructed to communicate the screen, however you want to do it. I mean, that's, that's, that's person to person, whatever your ter terminology is that it's up to you. I mean, you know, I, I, the best way to, to get some clean terminology is to go watch, if you can, uh, an NBA training camp situation because they have so much player movement and so much like free agency and trades and stuff, their terminology is so clean. I mean, I don't particularly love some of it, and I make fun of my buddies who are in the NBA about some of it, but it's so clean and so simple because they need players to be able to go show up the next day and be able to play the next day and not be confused by terminology. So if you want to get some simple, clean terminology, that, that, that would be a place where you could get it. Even watching on NBA TV training camp, the, the training cap access they have and not listening to the people talking, but listening to what's being said in the background, the, the terminology is, is very simple, very clean and, and consistent throughout the league. I mean, Chris does a lot of stuff with NBA teams. So do I, I mean, it, it is very consistent, but whatever your terminology is, your terminology, but basically with our posts, say, say we're down in a ball screen. So in other words, the guard's got a, hear that there's a screen, change where his feet are to deny access. Our post cannot change where he goes until he knows the post is not, or the guard has not only heard his communication, but has reacted with his feet to his communication. So read, reads his feet. So as soon as he sees that the, po the guard has moved, that's the guard's communication to the post that he heard him and he, this is where the ball is going to go. So it's a case of reading the feet in that, in that situation. And we do it the same on offense. You know, like we, we are spacing to get a shortcut on the spacing. We want them to read the closeout. So if Chris is closing out on me, I expect the other four guys not to be looking at me, to be reading Chris's feet and – anticipating where I'm going to attack based on Chris's feet. So you're reading the defense's feet to understand where you're likely going to space 85 to 90% of the time. So you get a head start on it. So you can, that, that half step is huge. It is huge against the best teams. It's not huge against the weaker teams, but it is huge against the best teams. And, you know, I see it. I see it when we play, the best teams, like where our sloppiness is and, and we learn from it. I mean, we're lucky enough in the OUA that there's always two or three teams that not only are good, but we have a huge rivalry with the coaches have been there a long time. They know what we do and, and we're going to see, we're going to see them at their best and we're going to see them trying to attack our weaknesses. And it, it's a great, we, we use those, the, those games as film for our national championship, but I mean, it, it, that, that half step is, is absolutely huge. But I see it when, I, when we play some of the average teams. They look really good against the other average teams and weaker teams. And I'm always, like, paranoid when they're playing us because they look really good. But then when they play us, they're always that half step late. They're actually pretty good at what they do, but they're not great at what they do or – Sorry, they're pretty average with what they do, and it's good enough a lot of the time, but they're not really – they're not good at it. And against us, I don't want to sort of – I mean, we're usually a top four team. Hopefully during the season, you have to be good to hurt us. And at the end of the season, hopefully you have to be great to beat us, just like we have to be great against the top seven teams in the country. A lot of those teams are just a little above average, and then when they play us, they're a half step late on everything. And it's like by third quarter, I'm going, man, this was not the team I saw on film. And the other thing is 
they also don't fight when they get down 20 like they do when they're in a tie game. And that's the thing that I think you need to fi fix in every one of your practices. You know, those blowout drills, they have to be, they have to be huge. Like when a team's getting beaten 11-2, that team, you cannot let that team shut it down. And, and that's how we, how we try, like how I would run our practice in terms of punishment. So if Chris and I were playing one-on-one -on -one and I'm the coach, and let's just say I beat Chris, but it's 11-10 and it's a war. All I'm doing is making Chris do five push-ups. He already, he already got what he needed out of it. He's already pissed because he lost by one in a game he could have won. So five push-ups is just to let everybody know who won, but really not kill him, kill anybody. If, if it's 11-2 and he quit, he's going to run a lot. Or if I lose 11-2 and I quit, he is going to run a ton. So that he hates quitting more than he likes quitting. You, can, you cannot let people in, be, be rewarded for the give up. We're not going to win anyway. You know, they got to know that if, if they fight back and lose 11-8 when they were down 10-2, that it's going to be 10 push-ups. But if they shut her down, it's going to be, it's going to be three tough sprints. Make them hate quitting. Forget the, the hating losing. Make them hate quitting. Love it. Love it. Coaches, uh, obviously, I can't encourage you enough. I know there's a lot of fluff when it comes to DVDs and different thing, products you can get from different coaches, and especially from celebrity coaches. But Dave did these all-access videos the way that he would do them, which is – real and raw like they are they are really what he does and uh you will be blown away if you haven't had a chance to get them uh the links are all there but it's davesmartbasketball.com and they're just tremendous resource uh to be able to get i will post the replay uh of this but i can tell you this do not waste your time emailing dave questions it just won't happen <laughs> you, you you know he's a great dude um, he is doing so many things and uh, consulting and speaking and helping the NHL and all the other things that he does. And uh, just, just don't bother. Go get the DVDs and, uh, or the All Access Praxis, and uh, you'll have a great experience learning from Dave. Dave, thanks for spending time with us. Thanks for having me, Chris. I really enjoyed it.